1980, the iconic phone company, AT&T, asked one of the smartest consulting companies around, McKinsey, this question. How many people will be using cell phones 20 years from now in the year 2000? McKinsey sharpened its pencils and came back with an answer. 900,000 people, they said. The actual number of cell phone users in the year 2000 was 109 million. And today, 900,000 new subscribers turn on their smartphones for the very first time every three days. I tell this story because sometimes things in tech get adopted much faster than the experts expect them to. And I believe we're at the cusp of another of these massive, very fast tech adoptions. And in particular, I think we're headed towards electric-powered, self-driving fleets of cars as opposed to the individually owned and operated gas-powered cars that we drive around today. My name is Frank Chen. I'm a partner at Andreessen Horowitz. And I want to spend a few minutes thinking about what does the world look like if this happens? Or more precisely, what does the world look like when this happens? Because I believe it's only a matter of time before we make this transition. And I believe we're at an inflection point where tech adoption could disseminate throughout the world much faster than we expect. And this inflection point is around the way we get around. In particular, I believe that in a handful of years, we're going to be driven around in electric cars rather than driving around in our own gas-powered cars. In other words, most of the miles driven on the planet will shift to self-driving electric car fleets as opposed to us driving around ourselves. What I want to do is explore what happens in the world when this comes to pass. What happens to the way we buy cars? What happens to the value chain? What happens to insurance? What happens to the energy infrastructure? I want to explore broadly the types of things that change in our everyday lives when this shift happens. But first, let me make the case that this shift is going to happen faster than we expected. First, let's talk about electric cars. May I present to you the 1914 Detroit Electric Model 47, an all-electric car available in 1914. People love this car. It was quiet. It had a range of 80 miles. It didn't need to be hand-cranked to start. And it was reliable. You didn't need a fleet of mechanics on standby making sure that your car would go. A lot of celebrities of the day drove this car. Thomas Edison, Mamie Eisenhower, John D. Rockefeller Jr., and very famously, Clara Ford, the wife of Henry Ford. In fact, a lot of people don't know that in 1900, 28%, nearly a third of all cars produced, were actually electric. Today, the overwhelming majority of the cars that we drive are gas-powered. If you look at this chart, the electric-enabled, and I'm being generous with electric enabled here, I'm including all the hybrids, all the plug-in hybrids, as well as all the all-electric cars like the Tesla, those are in blue, and you can barely see them on this graph of total car sales. Now, there are a few outliers. Norway is almost at 50% now. The Netherlands is 6% electric. California is 5% electric. But overall, under 3% of today's sales of cars are electric. So it's about 500,000 out of 18 million cars sold in the U.S. Why is this? If electric cars were available at the turn of the century, and they had all these benefits, they were quiet, they had a good range, they were reliable, why don't we drive electric cars today? Well, the simple answer is economics. In 1914, the Model T cost $440. It was anywhere between two and six times cheaper than the Detroit Electric that I showed you on the previous slide. Not only was it dramatically cheaper, it could go faster, 45 miles per hour versus 20, and it could go farther. 200 miles versus 80. Despite the overwhelming dominance of internal combustion engine cars, The Economist last August wrote an article that was essentially an obituary for the internal combustion engine. Why is this? Why did The Economist write the obituary? Well, if you look at the cost curves for electric cars, they are coming down fast. The most expensive part of an electric car today is the battery, and battery prices are falling very quickly as production ramps up, like Tesla's Gigafactory. Most analysts assume that electric cars will be as cheap to produce as gas-powered cars with no government subsidies by 2025. Electric cars also have radically fewer moving parts, and presumably as a result, radically longer useful lives and radically improved reliability. If you look at a Tesla or a Leaf in an electric car and compare it, 
to an equivalent internal combustion engine car, the number of moving parts in electric cars is anywhere between one and two orders of magnitude, fewer moving parts. As a result, most people expect electric cars to last for 500,000 to a million miles compared to internal combustion engine cars, which have an expected lifetime of closer to 200 or 300,000 miles. So we'll have cars that cost less to produce and last much, much longer. And I believe these trends have emboldened new companies to get into the car making business that never would have gotten to the car making business otherwise. My favorite example of this is the British company Dyson, which is well known for its vacuum cleaners and bladeless fans. It's committed to launching a car by 2020, has invested 2 billion pounds to date in bringing that car to market, and has more than 400 people working on it. I believe that had we not been in the middle of this shift to electric cars, in other words, if Dyson had had to make an internal combustion engine car, it never would have greenlit this project. Now, the incumbents aren't just going to give up and roll over. They are also making huge investments in this direction. Now, I personally love a good Twitter fight, and especially ones that involve Elon Musk. Here's one from September 25th of 2017. USA Today wrote that Mercedes was making a billion-dollar bet to take down Tesla, and Elon Musk replies to the tweet saying, hey, Mercedes, that's awesome, but you're a much bigger company. A billion dollars is not a lot of money. To which Daimler actually replies, I love it. You're absolutely right. You're missing a zero. We're investing a billion dollars in the battery production. We're investing $10 billion to electrify our fleet. To which Elon Musk says, good. As further evidence that the incumbents aren't just going to wait for the startups to steal their market, here's a chart that shows you a wide variety of electric power cars that are available on the market today. And this number is growing rapidly. So think of those as the carrots. In other words, the things that the marketplace is doing to encourage us to buy and drive electric cars. We're also going to have a set of sticks in the form of government regulations. There are already a set of countries that have laws on the books that outright ban the sale of gas-powered cars. The Netherlands by 2025, also Norway, India by 2030, Scotland by 2032, and so on. Along with the outright bans, there's going to be targets for electric vehicle sales that each country sets that will dramatically encourage existing companies that are selling gas-burning cars to invest heavily in electric-burning cars. And we're going to have new jurisdictions introduce rules of their own. Everybody's waiting for the big dogs, so to speak, to write down their rules around when it will forbid the sale of gas-burning cars. And I'm talking about countries like Germany, China, California, and then the United States overall. So there's going to be a combination of carrots and sticks encouraging us to get into electric cars. So you take all of those ingredients, and Bloomberg is forecasting 2038 as the year where electric cars reach parity in terms of sales with gas-burning cars, and then they never look back. That will be the year of peak gas car production, 2038. Keep that in mind, and we'll come back to this in a later part of the presentation. All right, so that's my case that self-driving cars are happening fast. Let's talk about the other component of it, which is the self-driving component. All the car manufacturers and a set of startups in Silicon Valley and around the world are working hard on this technology. Apparently, if you are going to innovate in the car, you always start in the trunk. There are a set of cars that you can already buy that have partial self-driving car capabilities. And the way I like to think about it is these cars will mostly drive themselves on the freeway. They'll keep a safe distance between you and the car in front of you. They'll keep in the lane, even if the lane curves. Now, you're responsible for driving the car after it gets off the freeway. But these are cars that you can buy today. And I'm not talking about the luxury cars only. You can buy cars in the $20,000 price range with a $2,000 option with a lot of these capabilities. So something like the Honda Civic with the Honda Sensing Suite. And around the world, we have progressive mayors and city leaders that are leaning into this revolution and are encouraging car manufacturers to run their trials in their city. Altogether, there are 40 cities around the world actively piloting a day. There's another 20 waiting to start their electric car trials. With all this activity, you'd expect both a lot of startup activity and a lot of activity in the existing 
manufacturers, and that's exactly what you see. You see an all-out amazing race between the incumbents, both manufacturers and companies in the supply chain. You see an amazing number of startups, primarily located in Silicon Valley in China, that are trying to take advantage of this opportunity and building self-driving technology that can go into any car. So you put these two ingredients together, the transition to electric cars and the transition to self-driving, and it actually the combination of these technologies is perfect for fleet operations. So instead of buying and operating our own cars, these things will be perfect for fleets to operate. One of the big reasons is utilization. Our own cars are utilized maybe 5% of the day today. So if you have a, a, a typical commute, you might be driving 20 minutes each direction or 30 minutes. That means your car is in use an hour out of the 24 hours of the day, and it's not driving anybody else around during that time. So from a fleet operator's point of view, they can do much better than 5% utilization. And the economics will dictate that most of our electric self-driving cars will end up in fleets because it's going to be much more economically efficient for the fleet to get the most out of that car compared to you and me driving them around. And so if you boil it down to what's it cost to own and operate a car, today it's much more expensive to be driven everywhere. So if you decided that you were going to commit to a lift anywhere diet, it would cost you a lot more to do that today than it would be to drive your own car. So that's the left side of these bar graphs. Rethink X, a nonprofit, is predicting that the cost curves will completely reverse themselves. In other words, by 2030, which is not that far away, it will be a lot cheaper to basically lift anywhere compared to owning and operating your own car. I think that a lot of people will start shifting when the prices are close. I think a lot of people would prefer to be driven around. And if it's even cheaper to be driven around than to drive your own car, I think this is going to be a mass market phenomenon. So the technology trend suggests that we'll have self-driving electric cars, but will the people be ready? Will we culturally be ready for this world in which we're driven around rather than driving ourselves around? It's a big shift. Well, as with most things, these revolutions will probably begin with the younger generations. This is an answer to a survey question that Morgan Stanley and BCG ran. And the question they asked essentially was, how many times are you already Lyft and Ubering around? And as you can see, the 18, 24-year-olds are doing it monthly or several times a month, and 13% of them are doing it every day. And that number drops off as the cohorts age. But the young people look amazingly ready for this revolution. Now, I'll mention something else here, which is there's also a lot of people who have been left out of the labor market, left out of the freedom of mobility that driving your own car represents, and that's older people, people with disabilities, people with blindness, people who don't have the hand-eye coordination to pass their driver's license exams anymore. So there's a whole set of people that can get back into society. They can take jobs, they can visit with friends, they can go shopping. And so the net of it is this revolution will come on the backs of the young people who are absolutely ready culturally to make this transition. And it's going to re-enfranchise. It's going to bring a lot of people who've been left out of the benefits of driving around right back into society. The older, the less capable, the people who can't drive themselves around. So for both ends of the demographic, self-driving electric car fleets will be awesome. So let's assume for a second that I'm right, and we'll put aside the question of when till the very end. We'll pick that up at the end of the presentation. Let's explore how the world changes. I want to explore how the world changes in six different areas, in the area of public infrastructure, energy, finance, the justice system, and shopping. How do our everyday lives change when we live in this world where we're driven around in electric cars rather than driving our own gas-powered cars?